you take your Bibles and turn with this morning in God's Word to Acts chapter number 17. Acts chapter number 17, and we're in Paul's second missionary journey. He's going to go to Thessalonica and also to Berea in our reading today. And there's some fascinating things here I believe the Lord wants us to understand and see and apply to our life, especially in regards to being a noble person. And being a noble person, what's it mean to be noble? I'm afraid that there is a mixed understanding of the definition of nobility. I'm not talking about nobility as in kings and lords. I'm talking about a person with a noble character, a person with a desire to do what's right, and a person that's willing to stand up for truth. And there's a contrast here in this passage of Scripture of a group of folks who were noble and a group of folks who were less than noble. And I want to share this passage of scripture with you today and ask the Lord to bless the preaching and teaching of his word. The Bible says in verse number one of Acts chapter number 17, now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the scriptures opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this, that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. And some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas, and of the devout Greeks a great multitude, and of the chief women not a few. But the Jews which believed not moved with envy, took unto them certain lewd fellows of a baser sort, and gathered a company, and set all the city on an uproar, and assaulted the house of Jason, and sought to bring them out to the people. And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren unto the rulers of the city, crying, These that have turned the world upside down are come hither also, whom Jason hath received. And these all do contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying, that there is another king, one Jesus. And they troubled the people and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. And when they had taken security of Jason and of the other, they let them go. And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. Therefore many of them believed, also of honorable women which were Greeks, and of men not a few. But when the Jews of Thessalonica had knowledge that the word of God was preached of Paul at Berea, they came thither also and stirred up the people. And then immediately the brethren sent away Paul to go as it were to the sea. But Silas and Timotheus abode there still. And they that conducted Paul brought him unto Athens, and receiving a commandment unto Silas and Timotheus for to come to him with all speed, they departed. Father, bless, I pray, the reading, teaching, and preaching of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Verse 11. You see what the Bible says in verse 11? These were more noble than those... In Thessalonica, as I've studied this passage of Scripture, that little phrase, these were more noble, has jumped off the page. I've been thinking about it quite a lot. And in this passage of Scripture, there's a contrast. Paul is on his second missionary journey, and he makes his way to Thessalonica. And the manner of his manner was, the way he did things, was he'd go to a town, he'd go to a city, and he would go to the synagogue. It's very important we note this because over and over and over again, in Paul's ministry, as it is his burden to reach the whole world, he is consistently ministering in synagogues. He's going where there are religious people. They're religious, but they're wrong. But they have a foundation, and they have a beginning. And when I think about what Paul's doing here, I'm really burdening my own heart about the church's ministry. I'm talking about Bible-believing, Bible-preaching, God-fearing, sincere people But the church's ministry to other churches that may, over the course of time, 
has veered away from the teaching of the truth. And I have a burden. I have a burden for other churches. I'm not in competition with other churches. I'm not jealous of other churches. As a matter of fact, if the Lord will allow, I pray God will use our church to be a blessing to other people. And I want to encourage the truth of God's word to be preached in every pulpit. And that's what Paul's doing. Paul's going from place to place. He's going to the synagogue. He's teaching and preaching the word of God. He is speaking and working with the folks with the burden that they might understand the truth. He goes to Thessalonica. And as in other places he goes, there are groups of people and even large groups of people who hear the truth, understand the truth, and believe in faith on the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. But at Thessalonica, the Bible says that there was a group of folks who did not believe and reacted in envy against Paul and Silas and Timotheus, ultimately acting in envy and sinfully against the lordship of Jesus Christ. And they gather up a group of people. The Bible says, lewd men of a baser sword. I like that. How many of you ever knew a lewd man of a baser sword? <laughs> they gather up lewd men of a baser sword, this, these uh, low lives, these people who are willing to uh, exercise, uh, once again, mob rule. <laughs> and they gather a company of people and they stir up the city of Thessalonica against God and his word, his people. And so Paul heads to Berea. From Thessalonica, he goes to Berea. In Berea, the Bible describes the people of Berea in verse number 11 like this. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica. In Berea, they preached the word, and the folks were willing to receive the word. They were ready with a ready mind to learn and understand and even take their own Bibles and prove or disprove what the apostle Paul had to say. And in Berea, God did a great work. Many people. The Bible says not a few. When you see that in the scriptures, it means a whole bunch. Not a few. A whole bunch of people put their trust in the Lord. But then, guess what happens? I mean, things are going great in Berea. But the people in Thessalonica, those Thessalonicans that were less than noble, they heard of the blessing of God in Berea. And you know what they did? They went to Thessalonica. I mean, they went to Berea from Thessalonica. And those same group of ruffians stirred up the people and caused havoc for the church. When we come to this passage of Scripture, the Bible says in verse 11, these were more noble than those in Thessalonica. Today's message is titled this, Noble. What is it? Noble. What is it? And I can't help but believe, as I look at this comparison and contrast, that some people act wickedly, believing in their hearts that what they're doing may be noble. But I believe it's time that we have a Bible definition of what noble, honorable, right is. Noble, what is it? Synonyms for the word noble are honorable, conscientious, principled. Ethical, honest, virtuous, trustworthy, respectable. I thank God for noble people. I thank God for people with a noble character who don't agree with me on everything. And that's wonderful and fine. Noble. The Apostle Paul looked at this situation and he said, Wow, the Bereans are more noble than the Thessalonians. And so today I'd like to share, with you, share this with you. Noble, what is it? First of all, let's just consider number one, noble Paul. A noble Paul, he was a noble preacher. Uh, he was an honorable, conscientious, principled, ethical, honest, virtuous, trustworthy, respectable preacher of the Word of God. It's important we pay attention to it. What's that mean? Let's just look at the Scriptures together. The Bible says in verse number one, Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica where was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them. Now, let's just look here and consider noble Paul. Paul has a method that's very important that we pay close attention to. Paul has a burden to share the gospel with people who do not understand it and do not know about it yet. 
Now, Paul, he begins, we see here in this passage of Scripture, his manner was, as his manner was, his manner was to go to the synagogues. He went to a very specific place. He went to the synagogues where there were people with a basic understanding of the Jews' religion out of which Jesus Christ came, and Jesus was the fulfillment of the Jews' religion, and he completed all the Old Testament law, and he is the Messiah that was promised to Abraham and promised uh, since the beginning we begin to read in the Scriptures. Now, Paul goes to the synagogue, he meets these people, and the Bible says that he went, as his manner, as his manner was, he went in unto them. I just want to take a minute and talk about that word went. It's important that Christian people understand that we have a duty to go into all the world and preach the gospel. To go into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in. Now, some of us have this lackadaisical approach to our faith, but I want you to know something. The Apostle Paul, God had changed his life. God had made a difference in his family. God had made a difference among his friends. God had changed his life. So Paul was compelled, and Paul had an earnest desire to go where people needed to hear. Now, folks, I'm not saying that God's calling all of us to a foreign field. He may be, and if he does, you should answer his call. But first and foremost, and primarily as people who are born again saved, we have an obligation. If we're going to be noble, we're going to be people of character and honorable, we have an obligation to go, to witness, to share the gospel with the people that we've come in contact with. We're not talking about going to Africa. I'm talking about going to the grocery store. I'm talking about going to McDonald's. I'm talking about going to work. I'm talking about going... Where there's people that you meet. And Paul with great intention because God had changed his life. He went where there was a need. And everywhere we look if we're honest there's a need. Think about every car that will pass by our church. During this morning worship service. Every person, every car is a soul for whom which Jesus died. And is somebody that needs to hear the gospel. And somebody that Jesus can change their lives. Someone that needs encouragement from God's people. And the Apostle Paul, he was a noble preacher. He's a noble Christian because he went. It doesn't stop there. The Bible says in verse number 2, Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them. And three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures. The next thing he did was he reasoned. Now, he didn't reason with man's reason. He reasoned out of the Scriptures. Uh, the word reason is not, nothing complicated. He, said, he says, I want to tell you something that I've learned from God and his word, and it's reasonable. It can make sense if you'll just listen to me a minute. It can make sense. Reasonable. Now, I love the fact that Paul was willing to reason with people out of the scriptures. I've heard a lot of folks say in my lifetime, just believe it. Well, I'll just tell you something. Cody Sturgill can't just believe it. I don't have it in me. Just because you say, I love you. But just because you say it doesn't mean I'm going to believe it. If it doesn't make sense to me, then it doesn't make sense. Now, I'll tell you, through the years, I've been wrong about lots of stuff. And I continue to have those moments more frequently than I'd like to admit. But we may disagree, but if you'll take just a minute and reason with me, and prove your point and make your argument, then I want to hear it. Now, the Apostle Paul, he did things the right way. His preaching was not preaching that says, believe, 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 only believe, without any reason. The first thing he did, he said, I'm going to reason with you. I'm going to show you that this, this message of the gospel, that Jesus of Nazareth is the Christ, that he died on the cross to fulfill the purpose of the Old Testament law and redemption for all men. I'm going to reason with you. I'm going to show you that what I believe is reasonable. And when I show you what I believe is reasonable, then perhaps and hopefully you'll be able to come to saving faith also. Now look, it isn't all reason without faith, but it isn't all faith without reason. And you know what's exciting to me? I can stand and preach Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, Sunday school. And I do not have to be afraid as a child of God of reason. 
What we believe from God's word is reasonable. When you compare it to the reality of people's lives, what we believe to be true in God's word is reasonable. It makes sense. And you can talk to people and you can explain to people and you can take people through their life experiences and point them to God's word. And God's word makes sense and God's methods make sense and God's understanding of his own creation, it makes sense. Reason. I love it. I love it. And Paul, he didn't go to the synagogue and tell you, all you Jews are awful. And that's not true at all. He went into the synagogue and he said, I want to tell you about what happened to me and why I believe that it is a reasonable thing to put your trust in Jesus of Nazareth as the Messiah. And the Bible says that this noble preacher, he used reason. It was reasonable. He reasoned out of the scriptures. He had the proper authority. He reasoned out of the scriptures. Verse number 2, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the scriptures. Verse number 3, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. What was he doing next? He reasoned. He also opened. I like the word opened. The word open literally means explained. It's a, it's, it's a little bit of a modern term, but a lot of times you'll hear a preacher, uh, maybe you hear a preacher on the radio preach as he gets in, into a text and he says, let's unpack this. And, and I understand the, I understand how, why they say that because quite frankly, you're looking at a passage of scripture and you unpack it. You, you open it up so you can see what's inside of it. It's nothing. We're not looking for anything uh, ridiculous but when we stand here and preach the word we just look at the word we put the pieces together in its context and then we see what's in it and that's what Paul was doing the noble preacher he didn't take some passage of scripture and take it out of context so he could make his point that's not what he was doing at all we heard and we talk often about uh, context and the Bible must always be taken in its context any text you take out of context is something that can't carry weight. I love this story, but a man said, I'm going to see what God wants me to know. And so he just takes his Bible and he flips through the pages and closes his eyes and puts his hands down. Anywhere I see what God says, that's what I'm going to do. He looks, he puts his finger on the page and he looks down and he says, and Judas went and hanged himself. He's like, oh no, that can't be right. So he flips through, closes his eyes, he says, I'm going to try again. And he flips through the page, he sticks his finger down and he looks again and he says, go and do thou likewise. Now, you can make the Bible say whatever you want it to say if you take it out of its context. But the Apostle Paul's burden was not to convince people that he was right and they were wrong. And that should not be our burden either. The Apostle Paul's burden was to convince people that Jesus was the Messiah and that the scriptures that they had held to were reliable. And he was stepping out of the way, pointing them to Jesus. Isn't it wonderful? He was opening the word. They had attempted as practicing Jews to discredit the 53rd chapter of Isaiah. They had attempted as practicing Jews to discredit the Messianic Psalms. But Paul, he opened to them those passages of scriptures. He says, the person that is being explained and talked about in Isaiah 53 is none other than Jesus of Nazareth that was born in Bethlehem and lived his life perfectly and paid the price for our sins on the cross. He says, I'm going to open to you the word. He opened, he explained the word. He alleged, look what the Bible says, in verse number 3, opening and alleging. The word alleging literally just means to prove. It literally means to lay alongside. He says here, I want to lay alongside the truths of, God's, of, of the Old Testament and the facts of what has happened in our recent history with the person of Jesus Christ. And the Bible says he alleges to people Jesus. He proves who they are, who he was. And it's amazing. What was he trying to prove? He was trying to prove the truth that Jesus Christ, what the Bible says in verse number 3, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered, that Jesus Christ died on the cross, suffered 
our shame, rose again. Hallelujah. Folks, I'm so thankful we can't just pass over there. We serve a risen Savior. Jesus Christ defeated death, hell, and the grave. Because he lives, we can live also. We serve a risen Christ. He's alive. He's proved to them, opened and alleged to them, proved to them that Christ must needs, must have to suffer. And he did. And that he died on the cross. He was buried. And that he rose again from the dead. And that this Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth, whom I preach unto you is Christ. What did he do? Opened and alleged the word. Well, the Bible says in verse 4, And some of them believed. I believe when we look at this, some of them would refer to the, the Jewish men there in the synagogue. Some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas. And of the devout Greeks, the, the Gentiles, the devout Greeks, a great multitude believed. And of the chief women, not a few, a whole bunch. What happened? When Paul nobly preached the word of God, he had results. Quite frankly, I think that there's a lot of preachers, and I don't want to be guilty. I believe there's a lot of preachers who leave their nobility behind, their honor, and will do anything they can to get a crowd or take an offering. But a noble Paul, when he honored the Lord and preached the word, and pointed people not to himself but to the Christ. God gave the increase. God gave the blessing. God saved the souls. Paul's method was not one of fear. Unnecessary personal guilt. Emotional sales. Paul's method. And purpose was understanding. What did he want? He wanted people to understand that Jesus Christ was their only hope. He wanted people to understand. And it should be our burden, not just as preachers, but as Christians, that people understand the Word of God. And when you understand the Word of God and it is presented honorably, nobly, Guess what happens? God does the work. And if God saves somebody, they're truly saved. It's wonderful. Paul was noble. Noble, what is it? Paul was a noble preacher. Number two, the less than noble Thessalonians. Less than noble Thessalonians. Look at the Bible says in verse number five. But the Jews which believe not. So Paul's preaching this noble message in Thessalonica. And the Bible says, But the Jews which believed not moved with envy, took unto them certain lewd fellows of a baser sort, and gathered a company, and set all the city on an uproar. What happens? Well, you have a group of people who believe. Then you have another group of people who do not believe. Now, I want you to pay close attention. Uh, these less than noble Thessalonians. Uh, the Bible says in verse 5, the Jews which believed not. I'll have you understand something. The Jews that believed not is not the problem. The problem was not that they didn't believe. You know that you can nobly disagree? I've met people who do not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, but have with honor and integrity been willing to agree to disagree. Now, I encourage everyone to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm confident that Jesus is the only way of salvation. But it is possible. And the sin here and the problem here with the Jews was not that they didn't believe. The problem was that instead of believing, they were moved with envy. I like that phrase, moved with envy. The, the, the actions that follow moved were the product of the envy in their hearts. They were envious towards the folks who believed. They were envious about the peace. They were envious about the grace. They were envious about the joy. Now I'll just have you know something. So much of the problems that Christian people face is rooted in envy. So much of the problems that noble, honorable people face is rooted in envy. 
Now, Christian folks should pity envy. We should pity someone that is full of sin and envious. But these Thessalonians, they were moved by envy. What did they do? It's quite interesting. They were moved by envy. And I, don't, I can't help but think that maybe down deep inside they thought what they were doing was noble or honorable. But it was far less than noble. And here's what they do. They say they're moved with envy. So how do we take care of this problem? We can't reason against the truth. We can't reason with the word that the apostle Paul has presented to the church, to the synagogue. So instead of reasoning, let's do something. Here's what they did. It's a practice that's still in practice today, unfortunately. The folks that were so angry and envious, they couldn't win their argument righteously or honorably or nobly. So they hire some people. Who do they hire? They hire lewd fellows. You see them, they're lewd. Fellows of a baser sort. I mean, they found folks out of the gutters that didn't care about honor, didn't care about integrity, and didn't care to incite violence and hurt people. Selfish, lewd fellows of a baser sort. And what else did they do? Those lewd fellows of a baser sort, the Bible says that they gathered a company. They got a whole bunch of other people just like them. Or other people that lacked understanding. Other people who, and they may have even preach the messages, if you'll go out and riot with us against this truth, this preacher, against this freedom, against this reason, if you'll go out and riot with us against this truth, then what you're doing will be noble. But God in his word says they're less than noble. And Christian people should never stoop To this type of reaction and to be led by our pride and envy to mobbery. But we must also never bow to it. You see, the Bible says that they, they gathered a company and set all the city on an uproar. What did they do? They said, we'll just, if, you, we, if we can't make sense of it, if we can't win the argument, then we'll just make a mess. And so they gathered a company, set all the city on an uproar. And it doesn't stop there. And assaulted the house of Jason. Uh, this is the first time we meet Jason. As far as I know, the last time we see Jason. But most folks believe that Jason was someone, and it was clear that at some point he had harbored, he had housed Paul and Silas. Some folks believe that he may have been a cousin to Paul. At any rate, Jason had harbored or had believed on and he was somebody of some prominence. And because he had accepted the reason, the mob attack somebody who is identified with the Apostle Paul. So they go to Jason's house. They assaulted the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. When they go there, they found him not. In verse 6, they drew Jason, certain brethren, under the rulers of the city, crying, These that have turned the world upside down are come hither also. They, they exaggerate. Now, there's no doubt that the Apostle Paul, in some respect, and the gospel had begun to turn the world upside down. But this is an accusation coming from the mob. They said, they said we're mad at Jason. We're mad at Jason's house. We're mad at, the, at Paul. We're upset because of the peace and the folks who believed in our synagogue. We don't like what these people have done in our city. And so they assault Jason. And they say, he is conspiring with these that have turned the world upside down. They overspeak. They overstate. They have no regard for truth. Verse number 7, whom Jason hath received, and these all do contrary to the decrees of Caesar. What do they say? All, every last one of them are acting against Caesar. Now, just before this, they, they didn't care if Caesar lived or died. But now they're using Caesar as an opportunity to make a mess. These all do contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is, not, there is another king, one Jesus. They had attempted the same argument. You remember what they said about Christ when they were going to crucify Christ? He calls himself king of the Jews. Caesar, are you going to accept that? Are you going to agree with somebody who's trying to take your place? Jesus wasn't trying to take his place. Jesus was not the king of Rome. He was not going to be the king of Rome. Jesus was the king of kings and lord of lords. And so the same foolish, empty argument that lacks nobility was something that they used 
The Bible says in verse 8, they troubled the people and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. And when they had taken security of Jason, they even put Jason, made Jason put post bond. When they had taken security of Jason and of the other, they let them go. Folks, the Thessalonians were not noble. The Thessalonians were moved with envy. And the product was violence and mobbery. The product was chaos and disorder. The product was lies and emptiness. The product was something that could not support life and promote families. The product was something that could not cause a nation to rise. The product was something that would only result and emptiness, and disorder, and dysfunction. You see the message that the Apostle Paul preached. It wasn't one that said, believe or else. It's believe and understand, and you'll have peace in your heart with God. But if you don't, that's okay. We'll love you anyway, and it's going to be okay. But we're going to have a noble cause, a noble preacher, less than noble Thessalonians, and finally, number three, more noble Berea. Look what the Bible says in verse number 10. And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea. Now, I want you to pay attention to verse number 10. Look what happened. Paul has just been doing his job. Paul's the servant of the Lord. He's the preacher. The Bible says the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night. I'm encouraged by that phrase. Do you know what happened? God's people protected God's man. I'm thankful for anybody that'll stand up for the preacher. Thank you. I'm going to stand up for preachers. I'm standing up for Pastor Chuck and Pastor Sexton and standing up for folks who've influenced my life, folks who are willing to, to lead the way. And though imperfect and often making mistakes, folks will be gracious and kind. And look here, the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas. They protected the preacher. Look again in verse number 14. And then immediately the brethren sent away Paul to go, as it were, to the sea. What did they do? They protected the preacher. I remember I was preaching at a church in Tennessee a while back. And I just cracked a joke. Their pastor, The pastor there is one of my best friends. I love him very much. And when we're just chatting back and forth, we just crack jokes and cut each other off. And we're just, if you heard us talk, you'd think we hate each other. But we just have a lot of fun. Just, you know, it's just pastor friends. And I remember this one guy, I made a joke about his pastor. And I, it was harmless. But he looked at me and he said, you mess with my preacher, I'll hurt you. <laughs> I said, I'm just kidding. And it was light. And that right after that, he said, you mess with my preacher, I'll hurt you. <laughs> and I thought, thank you, Lord, for somebody that loves God's man, and God's servants like that. I'm thankful for it. So here's what happened. In Berea... And in Thessalonica, they were folks who were doing the right thing. But in Berea, a more noble Berea. Look what the Bible says in verse number 11. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that. What, is, what does the word of God say makes these people noble? We've spent a lot of time seeing in, the, in Thessalonica what was not noble. But here in the scriptures, the Bible says this is noble. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind. I like that phrase, received the word with all readiness of mind. What were they doing? Were they immediately saying, yes, sir, Mr. Paul, whatever you say, Mr. Paul, sir, whatever you say. No, they weren't bowing uh, mindlessly to the apostle Paul and to his rhetoric. They said, all right. If you can tell us and explain to us why you are right and we are wrong, then here we are. We're ready to listen. We're ready to listen. They receive the word with readiness of mind. Now, folks, I've battled in my heart, and I want to be this kind of Christian who doesn't have to be right all the time, who can be taught from both the word of God and other faithful people. You see, they received the word with readiness of mind. 
They received the word. They were ready to hear. They were ready to consider. They received the word with ready, ready to mind. And look what the Bible says next. And search the scriptures daily whether those things were so. Every day that the apostle Paul carried something to them and said, Now look, here's why I believe Jesus of Nazareth is the Christ. They listened carefully. And you know what they did? They went home and found out for themselves. I love it when someone comes to me and I'll preach something or show or explain something from the scripture that may be a little different than what you've ever known before, ever thought before. And I remember this happening on numerous occasions, but I remember one specific time not terribly long ago. And I'd explained something from the text and we'd talked about it and applied it. And someone came to me on that evening on Sunday night and they said, said we was hearing about that and we went home and just found out if Anybody else thought the same way you did? And they got their Bibles out and started studying and read some commentaries. They even listened to J. Vernon McGee. They said, we were amazed to see that you, you agree with J. Vernon McGee right there. And I don't always agree with J. Vernon McGee, but uh, in that case we did. But I was encouraged. I'm not as discouraged if someone says, I don't know, preacher, tell me about that. I'm not discouraged. I'm encouraged because, you know what? I can't think for everybody. and I can't hardly think for me. But I'll tell you something, you can think for you. And if you'll let God's word be your guide and your rule, and you'll study to show yourself approved, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, guess what will happen? God will say, that's noble. And God will point you in the right direction to have faith in what is true. I don't know about you, but I want to have faith in what is right and faith in what is true. I don't care to be wrong. I care love the opportunity and the thought that God will show me what's right. And it was noble. The noble Bereans, they received the word with all readiness. They searched the scriptures daily, proving or disproving their own hearts what had been taught to them. The Bible says in verse number 7, therefore, because they received the word and understood the truth, therefore, because they searched the scriptures, therefore, many of them believed. Also of honorable women which were Greeks, and of men, not a few. Isn't that wonderful? The noble Bereans, you know what happened? When they sought to know the truth, they found the truth and believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and had everlasting life. Noble. Folks, it's noble to yearn to understand. It's noble to honestly seek in the word of God, the truth of God, it's noble. It's not noble to be manipulated by your own sinfulness, moved by envy. It's not noble. But it is noble to honestly seek to know God and his word. Noble. What is it? Noble. Noble is someone who... Just willing to seek to understand God. Honest about themselves. Trusting the Lord. Noble. I don't know about you, but I want to be noble. Not so I can puff myself up. But noble so that I can understand God. And God's purpose and God's will for my life. Noble, what is it? I think the Bible's made it clear.